In this video, we're going to add lights, materials, and obtain JPEG output from our model file. All of the renderings that will be done, both as stills and as animations, will be done using the Scanline renderer. Mentalray, which is a much higher quality rendering engine, uh, takes a little bit more time to learn, a little bit uh, longer to render. For those who haven't been through ARC 452, it would be a substantial burden to undertake in a short amount of time. So first I'm going to place some lights in my scene and uh, I'm going to go to the Create tab and we'll pull over to where we find lights. Since we're going to be working with Scanline, we don't want to be using photometric lights for this particular exercise. We're going to pull down to where it says Standard Lights and we'll be using Target Spots, Direct Lights, Omnis and so forth. What I'm going to do here is select uh, a couple of Omni lights. So we'll select Omni and we'll go ahead and click out into the scene somewhere. Now once I've placed an Omni light in the scene, we can begin to see how light is going to interact with the, the geometry. So I'm going to go ahead and pull this up into space a little bit. And uh, we'll leave that one light there uh, for right now and come back and set its properties in just a little bit. Next what I'm going to do is place <clears throat> a target spotlight and uh, we're going to use this to emulate our sun rather than to use a sun object. And uh, if I'm choosing this particular camera angle, I'm going to have my light here come from the left, move towards the right, and cast a shadow out this way. We'll move to the top view and click and drag from where the light is to where the light shines. Now this particular light, when we place it in the scene, if we zoom out, you'll notice that it just sits on the ground. So we're going to need to move that light up into space. I'm going to use the Move tool, and we can move both a light source and its target independent of each other. I'll select and drag the target spotlight up into space and we can also move and reposition the target the place at which the light is shining and what I want to have is light being cast across this producing a shadow here in this direction okay next what we want to do is go back and select the light and with the light selected if we move to the modify tab you'll see all the properties that go with that light so we see right now that this is a spotlight that it's targeted it has shadows that are turned on. Uh, going to move down here, we see it says ray trace shadows. We can also adjust the intensity color and the attenuation. That means the, the fall off to the light. And by default, it's set to a multiplier of one. We'll leave it at that for right now. Then we also see beneath this, let's go ahead and roll this up. We see spotlight parameters. And inside here, we see the hot spot and the fall off. What that corresponds to, you see there's two cones that comes off of this light. There's an inner cone and the outer cone. And the inner cone is where the light is bright or white. And then the fall off is the distance from the inner cone to the outer cone where it's going to end up going to black. So this would be a fairly sharp spotlight. And what we want to do is have this be a little bit more like a natural light. So we're going to spread the distance out from the inner cone to the outer cone. And if you come back down here to the spotlight parameters, we'll increase that outer cone uh, to something you know huge so it's almost off the screen. So we have a light shining on this. Let's go ahead and quickly test this. Now, uh, the next thing to be concerned about is our rendering engine. We said we're going to use Scanline. So I'm going to come back up to my render setup and we'll select and we'll get a dialog that allows us to set up our rendering engine. Well, we're looking in common parameters right now and we'll just have a single frame output from this. We can leave it at 640 by 480 right now. I'll scroll down. Uh, likewise, we can set up the save to uh, is this going to be saved to a JPEG? Okay, then let's say that's going to be a JPEG and we can give it a name. I'm going to call this test2 since I already have a test file in here. Save. And uh, we can set the resolution to the JPEG here at this moment as well. If we scroll down a little bit further where it says assign renderer, you want to confirm that your rendering, your production rendering engine is Scanline. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that and you'll see that uh, we want our default to be Scanline Renderer. Let's go ahead and select OK. Now, brief note, you can't mix and match materials and lights between Scanline and Mental Ray. There are materials and lights that are peculiar to Mental Ray that work only with Mental Ray. And likewise, there are materials and maps that are peculiar to Scanline that render with that. So once we start down this path, that's the path we continue on with. Now, for those who've been through 452, if they choose to make all their animations with Mental Ray, that's their prerogative. But for the majority of you, we're going to walk through this in Scanline because there is a body of knowledge that can't be conveyed in a short amount of time here. 
Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and click render, and what I'm going to get is a rendering of the active viewport at the moment. We can choose to override that and force the rendering to be a specific view. For right now, uh, the best thing for you guys to work with is to render the active view. So here you see the current view is perspective, and that's the renderer. You could always force this to be one of the other views that happens to be out here on the stage. Let's go ahead and render. So we see our finely articulated model here with our stairs and railings and ramp and the wall. And of course, if we looked on the opposite side, it'd be hard to see anything because there's uh, no light back there. Now you also notice there's two shadows. So we placed an omni light on the scene. And generally speaking, if we're going to have uh, an outdoor scene, this is planet Earth, there's one sun. We'll have one sun casting shadows, and we'll have uh, a few omni lights to kind of wash the shaded side of the building so that it's not in total darkness. Now, if we were on the inside of the environment, it would be the reciprocal to that. We we're going to have uh, multiple lights casting shadows. This is typically what makes an interior scene look more believable. Let's go ahead and close this. We don't need to really save this any further. So, what I'm going to do next is go ahead and close our rendering setup and come back here and we'll make some adjustments. I'm going to select my Omni Light and we're going to go ahead and turn the shadows off on that and we're also going to turn the intensity on the Omni Light down. Maybe I'm going to turn that down to about 60 percent and I'm going to also take that Omni Light and I'm going to copy it around here uh, to the back side of the building to sort of wash that side of the building with a little bit of light. Now to make copies inside 3D Studio, hold down the shift key and move, scale, or rotate a copy. So I'm dragging a copy over here to the back side, which will allow that back side of the building to be washed with light. And uh, when it comes to cloning or copying these Omnis, I find uh, it's best to do this as an instance. Uh, that way we can make adjustments to all the lights globally, acts like a kind of global illumination um, of the lower grade kind, given we're in scan line. Instance is turned on, and uh, I'm actually going to make a couple of copies of that. And remember the difference between copy, instance, and reference. A copy is an outright copy. Uh, instance is going to be like a clone. So we change one, they all change likewise. And reference is something that um, has some sort of bearing if we're using the modifier stack. And uh, we'll come back to that eventually. Let's go ahead and click OK. And if I zoom out a little bit here, we'll see there's my uh, second copy. And uh, we'll sort of position these around the wall house uh, to act as a kind of global illumination around here. Now there's no reason why these all have to stay in the same plane. You can sort of move them up and down um, so that they're in different positions. The other thing that's missing in the scene right now that would allow this to look more credible is to have some sort of a ground plane. So I'm going to go to the create tab and we're going to go to geometries and select box and I'm going to click and drag a box across the scene and we'll drag down just slightly to give this some depth, not up because if we go up it's going to encroach on our wall. Of course we could always move this down so it's below our wall house. We see we're floating here just a little bit so I might want to either move the whole wall house up or down or move the whole ground plane up or down. I'm going to move that up so it's just here at the bottom of my wall. Uh, I also don't want to see any of these edges. I want this uh, environment to be completely filled by this ground plane. It looks a little bit more credible. So we'll come into our modifier tab now and let's uh, expand the box so it's off camera. Thinking a little bit more like a movie producer here. Once again, I'll make my perspective active. And now since my rendering has been set up, I can easily just select the teapot without having to go through the setup and it knows, hey, yes, we're going to render this and we already saved test two. Do you want to overwrite it? Yes. Um, this is just junk for me. So I'm going to write over the top of that. And of course, now we see that green ground plane. We actually see the fall off in here from our spotlight and we should see shadows now cast on the ground from our spotlight. So it looks to me like my light is a little bit too hot and um, that's easily remedied. Um, I think I have a little bit too much light inside here with the Omnis, so we can toss out one of those Omnis or we can uh, knock back their uh, intensity slightly and uh, I might do one or both of those. Let's go ahead and close this. We'll go here and select Omni. If we go to the Modify tab for those Omnis, we'll go ahead and pull down the value substantially to something uh, fairly light. Um, now also I want to make note that inside uh, versions 2010 and 2011 we can also come to the 
pull downs for the viewport and I can select and pull down to um, lighting and shadows and illuminate with scene lights. Now if illuminate with scene lights is turned on and lighting and shadow enable hardware shading is turned on we should be able to see in real time a little bit more accurate approximation um, of what the lighting outcome would be. I don't have my shadows turned on right now too so we could also come back and turn those on as well. So we see a sort of approximation of what the outcome would be it makes it easier for us to make adjustments. Okay so now I want to place materials on one of the items here just to walk you through that part of this and I'm going to come up to the material editor and select and when I do I'm going to get the material editor dialog and you'll see inside here my material editor has been pre-configured for mental ray so we see a bunch of these black um, balls inside of here and what I want to do is let's select an empty cell and we're going to come down here to where we see the tab right about in the middle our mind says arc and design at the moment I'm going to click on that and I'm going to select standard and once I do that it allows this to be a material type that works okay with scanline uh, with that selected uh, we can come in here and double click on the color swatch diffuse and give this some sort of color um, maybe I'll make mine yellowish at the moment um, what we're going to do here is set up materials that are just generic colors we can come back and add maps later um, if the material has been assigned to the geometry then if we make changes to the material it'll update inside the model file in real time and so let's uh, incrementally work up to the more difficult side of this for those who are entirely new to 3D Studio. Now there's a couple ways to go about this. I could just click and drag this onto the geometry and you see it highlights wall. Now if I let go, now wall has been turned yellow. We could alternatively, uh, let's make a new color here, let's click standard, maybe this one is going to get a color that's um, you know a little less saturated yellow, maybe it's a little more washed out. Now in this case I'm going to select the fin wall, pre-select the fin wall, and then I have my new color swatch here that's been selected. There's a button here that says assign material to selection. So if I click on that, that's an alternative way to get the material onto a geometry. So what you want to do is go through and assign materials to all of the pieces and parts in this fashion just with simple colors for now. And the difference being between this and the CAD colors is that uh, now that this has been set up inside the material editor, we can go back and elaborate further, turn these materials into concretes, stones, metals, and so forth. Okay, the last part of this is to get some output. So if we go back up to our render setup, what we're looking to do at this point is just get a single frame rendered out, and we want that rendered out at 640 by 480, that's our output size. 3D Studio doesn't consider resolution as a function of printing, it's just a total pixel count. You could type in whatever value you want here. In a sense, this is a user-defined area, or you could use one of these predefined um, output sizes, which correspond to conventions of video. So single frame, width and height, and if we scroll down, you also want to be certain that you're saving this to some place, okay? And of course, finally, make sure that the render that you're working with is scanline, particularly those who haven't been through ARC 452. I'm going to go ahead and click render now and we should see it's going to ask me once again do you want to overwrite test 2 okay yes and then we're going to find our our output so we see my yellow colors that have been added to the two walls uh, now shows up in the rendering now the grays that are on here are attractive with the yellow yes but there are no official materials assigned to any of these parts yet so be certain that you don't walk off and leave the geometries with no material assignment. It'll just make for more work downstream. One last thing I should make note of before moving forward is typically as we work inside the perspective viewport it's awkward to tell you know are we getting uh, exactly the perspective or view that we want um, inside here to match up with the output. Okay I haven't set up a camera yet so I'm gonna go to create cameras and I'm gonna click and drag in my top view from where the target camera is placed to where the target camera is looking and of course I want to move my camera a bit up into space maybe I'm about at eye level if I right click on the camera I can 
also jump over to my target and get a hold of that. And once my camera has been placed, I now want to see out through that camera. And if we look in our perspective viewport, it's set to the canned or generic perspective at the moment. If we're going to go ahead and click on that, now I have a camera available. And I want to look out through the camera, and this is what the camera sees. So it's much easier to control exactly what I'm going to see if I have a camera placed. And uh, of course, I can manipulate the properties of the camera, not unlike the lights. And uh, part of that is the positioning of the camera in space. And also part of that is adjusting the camera's properties. So if we go to the Create, Modify, and then Modify tab, we can see we have the properties of the camera here. We can adjust the, the lens and the depth of field and any number of things. Now you'll notice if I pan and zoom now that um, the panning and zooming of this viewport also causes the camera to be repositioned in space. One last thing about placing the camera is we want to be able to have the viewport match up with the resolution of our output. And if I come inside here to the camera um, list and pull down to where it shows safe frames and I select that, you'll now see a representation of our output proportions. It allows us to better gauge exactly um, what will be visible and what will not be visible and how to compose our frame.